Um, first of all, welcoming me into the team. Um, it's one of the first meetups that I started going to in recruitment, so it's nice to come full circle. I'm really excited to deliver this talk on mental health at work, as Laura mentioned. Um, it's a really current topic at the moment, um, something that I've got a lot of experience with and training on and qualifications as well. So the content, um, this is kind of the basis of what I'm going to cover, uh, a little bit about me and, um, you know, my mental health story as well. Um, I've worked in companies that have been at both ends of the spectrum and um, places where um, I've had a real kind of lack of support and um, quite toxic places to be fair. And, um, you know, now I work somewhere that I, I really couldn't ask for any better so tying in those experiences with with what you should really expect um, from an employer um, I'll also talk to you a little bit about the impact of mental health slash illness in the workplace and what is the benefit of employers investing in mental health interventions uh, there is also quite a difference between the short-term plaster solutions that what that's what I like to call them versus the long-term systemic change which is what we actually need um, to tackle mental health issues in the workplace. Um, and then also talking a little bit about how can you actually pick up the signs that your colleague is struggling, especially working remotely, it is really hard because you don't have those like physical cues that you would pick up on, like if you were in the office and actually navigating around that topic, it's quite a sensitive topic as well. So, you know, actually knowing what are maybe the right things to say, maybe not what to say. Um, and then some other solutions. And also I will finish off with some more resources um, that you can go on to do some further reading, um, some really good studies as well, because honestly, there's so much to cover on mental health in the workplace. And I've got 20 to 25 minutes, so I don't want to speed through it too much. And um, so I'm just going to touch on those key areas. Just some notes as well before I start um, is that please do feel free to ask questions and discuss throughout um, the, the talk like in the chat so you don't have to wait until the end. Also it's always really awkward when you say like any questions and nobody says anything so just stick it in throughout that'd be great. Um, and if you want to ask something but want to um, you know keep it sort of anonymous from like the group obviously not to me and um, you can send it through like a direct message um, in the chat as well um, and every you know every company and individual is different so you know if you haven't have an experience that you feel comfortable enough to share like please do but be respectful about it keep individuals names out of it and the companies as well so it should be there to help people associate their experiences too. So a little intro on myself, I'm Parol, it's, it's pronounced like Carol, but with a P and my pronouns are she slash her. I work for Manhattan Partners um, as a JavaScript recruiter and I'm also uh, officially a mental health ambassador for them as well. I do some volunteering with Code Your Future, they're amazing, definitely look into them. And also one of the Manchester Web Meetup organisers as of like last month really. And there's a lovely picture of me on the right with um, my boss John's dogs as well. So I'm a big dog lover. I love food. For anybody that came in early, I wouldn't stop talking about pizza. Um, and obviously not originally from Manchester, like grew up in Liverpool, um, which is that really nice looking picture in the bottom, which I don't think is really an accurate representation, but you know, we'll, we'll park that there. So like my mental health story, um, I was diagnosed with depression um, about just over like a year ago um, and anxiety a few years before that. I have an history of eating disorders and I also um, a month ago was diagnosed with ADHD, um, which some people do classify as a mental illness, some people don't, but it is directly linked to anxiety and depression and it can really exacerbate it. So when I got that diagnosis, I was like, yeah, that explains a lot. And as I mentioned, I've really worked at places that have had quite a negative impact on my mental health um, because of, you know, micromanagement, overworking, horrible bosses. And, you know, right now at Manhattan Partners, um, I genuinely couldn't ask for any more from the founders, Julie and John, who really go above and beyond. So I'll be giving some examples of what they actually do, which have actually really helped support me and my colleagues as well. For example, we have um, a generous holiday allowance unlimited 
unlimited sick days mental health days um and I'm not afraid to like talk about like mental health in like our morning meetings um and I can offload like work wherever I need it so it's been a great sport of environment to be in and I think it's a little bit of a myth that people think that you have to be at a big cash rich corporate company that is going to pay for like your therapy and things like that to be really well supported because that's not true you know we're a startup we've been running for like two years so um so going on to right right in the beginning um the different types of mental illnesses and the definition of mental health um is on the screen there it's which is by the world health organization it's a state of well-being in which every individual realizes their own potential can cope with the normal stresses of life work productively and make a contribution to the community so i think that was quite well put what i wanted to put in the spotlight as well is that you know i think we all know that mental health is becoming more like it's got less of a stigma you see it talked about so much more in work in friendships in relationships on social media but there's a lot more than just stress related disorders depression and anxiety to mental health they're the main ones that are really in the spotlight a lot because they are like the most common but I think you really need to make yourself aware of the other ones that are there so you know obviously the eating disorders classes of mental illness bulimia anorexia orthorexia personality disorders schizophrenia ptsd addiction um there's a lot in there i'm not going to go into it because i'm not i'm not a psychiatrist um but just to kind of like make you like just raise some awareness around that so i mean alongside covid i mean we, we've all probably had the, one of the most difficult years of our lives right um there's been a secondary pandemic which has been unfolding right in front of our eyes which is the mental health crisis experts actually expect the lasting effects of the pandemic on mental health to be 10 years which is quite shocking there have been cuts to you know the like the mental health like services as well and um, you know people have lost loved ones but the positive thing is that it's thrusted mental health and illness right into the spotlight um and i think we've all learned to be like more compassionate to each other as well like we see our colleagues as like as like humans that have struggles that have like feelings so i think that's great and this is my favorite quote from mental health first aid which is workplaces play a key role in creating a society where everyone's mental health matters i just thought that was really really powerful so i wanted to put that in there so let's go into, you know, who doesn't love a couple of graphs and facts and figures and things. So what's the impact of mental health on the workplace? So 58% of individuals um, surveyed said that they were experiencing stress and at least mild symptoms of depression at work. And 63% of people were experiencing mild symptoms of anxiety. So um, that's pretty high. It's pretty high. Um, also, I mean... I just thought I could maybe get people to put some guesses in the chat in like, I'll give you a few seconds. So please actually do this, by the way, there are no wrong answers. What do you think the cost to employers of poor mental health in the UK is per year in pounds? Okay, so we've got 150k, 3 million, 10 billion, 1 million, 12 billion, 50 billion. Ooh, 100 billion. 100 million. I mean, the, there's only one person who's actually close. It's so much higher than you think it is. I don't think you're ready for this. It's actually 45 billion pounds per year. And the figure on the right actually shows the breakdown costs. So 15% of that is from actual absence, not being at work because of mental health. 20% is because of turnover. So you've lost somebody because they've struggled with mental health and you've had to pay to replace them. And then 64.1% is presenteeism. Now, this is a term that not a lot of people I've spoke to have been like aware of. So presenteeism essentially means that you're at work, but you're out of it. Like how many of you have felt physically or mentally so unwell that you didn't want to go to work, but you've gone to work because you were scared of the repercussions. You were scared of what would happen because your workload got too much. Yeah, that's the, that's the cost of you doing that which is not your fault 
it's probably the companies that was probably a bad word phrase but you know it's something that people maybe don't don't realize and I'm sure a lot of you you know are a big fan of friends I love this episode so if anybody remembers the one where like Phoebe's trying to teach Joey French so I found this and I thought how fitting because when we talk about the solutions to support an employee's mental health and well-being you know we I think it starts to descend in a conversation about like early finishes on Friday and team bonding and and yoga classes which is like fine like they help but they're what I call a short-term plaster fix but what we really need is the long-term systemic change which actually enables people to do their best work and it's more longer term and the payoffs are great. So examples of kind of like short term fixes and like I'm not slating this at all, by the way, like we have a lot of these too. But if you have these alone and you think that you're fixing the mental health of people around you at work, it's that got a shocker for you. So that's like mental health webinars, bring your dog to work day, having a Friday off of work, a Headspace subscription, pizza Fridays, fruits in the office again all like really good things but what we actually need is reducing employee workloads the freedom to work autonomously a sense of purpose option to remote work if you want it some people don't not feeling guilty for taking annual leave or sick days that is a really big one and actually having enough to take as well Um, and then leadership leading from the front as well creating that safe space to talk about mental health openly So, I mean, that's been a really, really big part of kind of, I like Manhattan Partners. So there's like a few things on the screen as well. I'll tell you a little bit about my kind of experiences with this. So a very recent example. So this morning I woke up and I felt, maybe it's because I was nervous about the talk, but I was feeling really anxious. I've, I've got quite a lot on at the moment. I work in recruitment, so it's a bit chaotic. So all I did, I sent, I sent a message to my director. I said, you know, not feeling in the right sort of like headspace. I need some help. I need to like reprioritize. I'm really anxious. And um, we had our morning meeting like not long after. And she was like, stay on with me. And she sat and she talked with me for just 15 minutes. So she was like, okay, what's making you feel anxious? What can we help with? What can we move around? What can we push back? You know, I had the meetup I was supposed to organize, um, you know, for, for ourselves. And she said, Let, let's push that back. Oh, it's, it's not important. Um. So I think that's a really big thing to be able to have that kind of open talk about it. Um, and then also having mental health days or people, some people call them duvet days is important. But even more important than that is actually knowing that you can take them without feeling the repercussions. So there was another stat as well, um, which is in the links in the resources, by the way, lots of studies done around this. 10% of people that opened up about their mental health problems to their managers um, suffered a dismissal and um, demotion yeah I know it's actually true so if you go on to the if you go into the study by Deloitte on the final slide um yeah it does actually happen which is quite sad so um and another really big one is learning how to set your boundaries so you start to learn how to do this from a child, you know, so, you know, what is okay for somebody to do to you or for you and what is not okay. So you should also carry those principles into the workplace as well. If you don't set your boundaries, living without boundaries in both work and personal life is really not sustainable. If you allow people to continuously overstep and violate your boundaries, you're putting yourself at really big risk of of burnout so our boundaries are really clear I set out I have a diarized hour most days an hour and a half lunch break in my diary and I don't have my work phone on me like in that time as well because I'm like exercising or like I'm on a run and like my colleagues know to like respect that as well so they're not constantly kind of because that's actually available so if you don't like you, if you don't have that you should maybe speak to your manager as well as that I need to diarize time so I get a lunch break because I'm actually really surprised that how many people actually don't take a lunch break because then your phone starts going off and you get those Slack notifications and you're like, oh, let me just, you know, have a look at this really quickly. Um, 
so learn to set those boundaries but also learn how to you know respect like your colleagues like boundaries as well and I think you want to do it like quite early on as well I feel like at Manhattan Partners like we genuinely understand each other's boundaries so when I'm at work like I don't I don't feel really anxious because of those and like I feel safe and um there's in the links as well there's a video by Brene Brown like she's amazing by the way you need to like watch her like shows on Netflix and, like listen to her stuff but you know there's a quote that she said on that about boundaries which is like I'm not as sweet as I used to be but I'm more loving so actually setting boundaries is a form of self-care love it okay so I just get worries that I'm gonna waffle a little bit this is a video by my mum who is in the group at the moment. So my mom is a, I'm not gonna slide it cause it's automatically playing. So um, my mom is a consultant psychiatrist and I asked her to make a short video to um, help me out with this talk. So um, it's a short clip. She's gonna talk to you a little bit about um, how you can notice the signs um, if somebody is struggling and how to navigate the conversation. Um, so I will let that play. Please put something in the chat, by the way, if you've got any issues hearing it. Yeah, I can't hear that at all on my computer. Mm. Can anyone else hear it? No. Oh, oh God, this is a nightmare. That would be really annoying if that was the case. Okay, let me just... Oh, someone's put, Zoom requires you to especially share audio. Um, oh. How do I do that? <laughs> I'll just play it off this. Right, can you all see that? Can you yeah. hear it? No, still can't oh. hear it. Oh, how do I share audio? Anybody? <laughs> <laughs> Why does it not let you do it? Oh, it says share sound. Okay, we're good, we're good guys. We're good. Oh, it's asking me for my password. <laughs> I love technical issues. I'm not going to have a meltdown. Can you hear that? Could you hear it? Um, click no. <laughs> no, I, I still can't hear it. Um, is there a way to open it in another window or something? Oh, I'd be really sad if I can't play it. Do you know what? Let me just go back to, I'll just go back to the presentation, just see if, if it plays through there. Um, and if it doesn't, then I don't know. Mark, I can hear you laughing, by the way. <laughs> it's so annoying. You sat in the other room. Sorry. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Dr. Meeta Singh. Yeah. I'm a consultant psychiatrist and I'm also Parul Singh's mum. Um, I just want to say to everyone that we're all going through tough times and COVID has really affected our mental health in so many ways. Um, people have carried on working oh, right. from home and that oh, yeah. has meant that they have kind of been isolated and just getting through their day jobs without actually having the buffer of the colleagues and the environment that helps with the mental health and the stresses and the deadlines. So it's been really tough times. And I just want to say that even though people are working remotely, there are ways that you can look at how your colleagues are doing. Are they okay or not? So for example, thinking about um, are people turning up to meetings on time? Is there any change in the way they, they talk to people, their attitude, their um, motivation, their uh, optimism? And if there's any change, if they feel like uh, um, not keen on doing things uh, and not kind of thinking about the deadlines as seriously they, they're used to, then probably there is a bit of a problem. And also things like 
are they looking after themselves? Are they well presented in the meeting or are they uh, are they talking about missing meals or not sleeping enough? So all those things are the signs that people can actually pick up even when you're working remotely and most of the times meeting through these uh, virtual meetings. So, and if, you, if you've if you noticed anything like that in your colleagues, then I think the most important thing is to really look after each other in these tough times. So really uh, addressing it in a very, very sensitive and gentle manner, really uh, just kind of saying, are you okay? Have you been... Have you been well? Um, is there anything that's bothering you? Are you worried about the work or anything else? Um, is there anything we can help you with? Are you struggling with the deadlines or with the workload? Is there anything we can do to help? And so obviously, uh, once things are spoken to in a very sensitive manner, most people are really looking for a friend, uh, a, help, a helping hand who can kind of uh, support and ask for their well-being really so i think these things are really really important uh, for us to make sure that we are kind of looking after our colleagues even when you are working remotely you're not in constant touch with each other so i think uh, i'll leave it at this and uh, i wish you i wish you guys all the best and i'm here if anybody needs an advice or to talk to i i'd be more than happy to uh, to help Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Oh, she is so cute. What an angel. So I know I'm running out of time a little bit. So um, in addition to sort of, you know, what my mum's <laughs> mentioned, um, what like mum's mentioned as well, is like, do you notice somebody's overworking? Do you keep getting Slack notifications and emails from them at like weird hours that they never used to? But like, you have to... You have to remember that it might be someone's normal pattern so you're looking for the changes in behavior so not just something that is different to yours um and how can you help as well try and avoid toxic positivity so try and avoid saying things like being negative won't help you good vibes only just stay positive and try and try and use phrases that are more like you know you're not alone we're there to support you things are tough is there anything that you want to talk about so you know there's quite a fine line but you've got to remember that you're not somebody's personal like therapist again boundaries and I you know you gotta you gotta know your worth as well like know when it's time to step away so learn how to realize like you're in a toxic work environment and if it's gone to like beyond the point of being able to save it you just gotta work walk away because I did that last year so have you been told that you're like lucky to have this job are you scared of your bosses are you walking on eggshells all the time is there loads of office drama are you scared to take time off um and if there's a really high turnover rate as well um that's a few things so some ways that I noticed that I was in this toxic work environment is that we were never officially told this, but like HR randomly told me one day that I can take a duvet day without prior notice if I need it. But I was actually genuinely really scared to actually use that because I thought I was going to get like, you know, for that really terrified and you know I was, I was literally I was working 10 hour days with an hour of travel each side and when I raised my mental health in a monthly catch-up with my director her solution to that was to you leave on time two days a week so you can go to the gym that's what she said I was like this doesn't help <laughs> it really doesn't help she made me cry in the toilets as well like honestly so, so horrible like I know it's recruitment that's probably really really drastic but that like genuinely happened I'm not dramatizing and also like you know I I lost a family member to the mental health last year and I had to take time off and like the only support that I got was a text saying are you all right? Like, how are you feeling? Very superficial. And like, they probably just wanted to know when I was going to be back in to do the work. And then when I came back in, like none of my teammates knew I was like, none of them asked if I was all right, <laughs> which was just, I already knew I was going to leave like at that point, but it really, really like solidified it to me. And um, you have to know like where you draw the line between you know, wanting to be in a good job, like good salary and things like that. But like nothing is 
nothing is ever worth sacrificing your mental health for like your mental health is as important as your physical health you don't wait until you're you know really like clinically overweight or you have like diabetes to go to the gym and eat healthy food like you do that throughout the same intervention should be done for your mental health both like personally and at work so you know know your worth like you are better than that so I just wanted to finish off with that and then also say that because honestly like I've I've been there like I've I've done that and you know obviously like really come back from it and I've had a lot of those you know experiences so if anybody wants to reach out to me you know through like LinkedIn or Twitter and um, like I am genuinely here to lend a completely non-judgmental ear and um, to like listen uh, I've also linked some like further reading and resources and links and things like that and um, the re I mean if you're going to look at any of those um if you're going to look at any of them it's the Deloitte mental health and employers one which is about like in the middle and um, there's some really really good studies and stats and interventions there's also a mental health at work checklist of all of the things and their long-term systemic change rather than the pastors so um yeah I mean I I know that I've, I've probably absolutely raced through it but um really hope you guys enjoy that like I said like please talk to me if you need anything and um feel free to just stick like some questions I know there was like a few things like going on so you know James has said that he's had to do the same thing you know walking away from a toxic job maybe not even having something lined up it's probably like a good position um good position to be in so if anybody has anything you can pop something in the chat if not then i will switch it off now but thanks laura thanks for your message that's real nice i'm like really warm <laughs> it's absolutely possible to do that um but yeah thanks so much guys really hope it helps and obviously like every, all the like the presentation is going to be shared um through like the meetup group but anyway so you'll be able to see that along with the recording thanks Awesome. Thank you so much. I think that was really, really good. Clearly everybody's uh, taken something away from that by the looks of the comments. So yeah, thank you so much. And, you know, it's sometimes it's kind of difficult to talk about these things, but I think the more we do it and the more we normalize it, the less scary and the less hard it becomes for everyone else. So you're like making it easier for other people by talking about it. So yeah, thank you. Um, oh, thank you. And thanks for all the, thanks for all the comments guys as well. It's honestly, it's so nice, but the more that we like normalize this, like everybody struggles at some point, you know, whether you're like diagnosed or not. So let's make it as normal as talking about like, you know, if you broke your arm over the weekend. So there's that. Exactly. Somebody <laughs> just put in the comments as well. So well delivered. And I have to echo that because you, you were saying you were really nervous beforehand. And honestly, it looks like you've done that about a million times. <laughs> just <laughs> so, yeah, well done. Oh, amazing. Thank you so much, everyone. Shall we um, grab a drink and just get like a couple of minutes break and then we'll come back and then we can start Ben's talk. Is that okay? Cool. And if anyone does have any questions, like if you think of them, you know, just feel free to pop them in the comments and just say, you know, forward parallel and we'll, we'll catch up with them when we get back. Cool. All right. See you in two minutes.
Hello, Ben. Hey. <laughs> How are you doing? Yeah, not too bad. Good. Good stuff. You uh, well, hopefully we won't have the uh, the screen sharing problems now that I've switched it on for everyone. <laughs> um, but yeah, maybe we'll just give everyone another minute or so, and then we'll kick off if that's all right. Yeah, sure, of course. Awesome, thank you. Hello. Hey. Hi, Ben. Oh, I'm really excited for your talk. Well, you're a tough act to follow, so thanks. It was a really great talk. Thanks so much. Oh, no worries. Really glad you enjoyed it. Shall we get started? Yeah, sounds good. Let me show my screen. Thank you. Is that coming through for you? Yes, it is. Perfect. Well, thanks so much for having me and a tough talk to follow such a relevant and important point. Uh, but to dig into cloud parallelism and serverless, um, my name's, oh, let me click the slides. There we go. My name's Ben. Um, I'm the VP of engineering at a company called Theodo. We help other people build digital products from startups launching their sort of initial MVPs to large enterprises doing digital transformation style projects. And my role at Theodo is really on the cloud side in helping people use serverless. So I'm also an AWS serverless hero, which is a very stupid title that AWS give me, which means I get to talk at events like this about serverless. And I also run the service transformation blog, podcast and newsletter, and also run the service meetup in London, which is remote at the minute. So you guys are more than welcome to join. Um, and I think there is a service meetup up north in Manchester as well, so it'd be cool to maybe do some joint events. But uh, today's talk, we're going to talk about serverless, we're going to talk about parallel computing, and then how those two things combine. Now, some of you might be familiar with serverless already, and some of you might not be, but it's quite a broad term that means different things to different people. To me, serverless is an architectural movement that allows us to build and run applications and services without thinking about the underlying servers. Developers can write very pure application code which is then sent to the cloud provider and run in a completely abstracted way. We don't think about the underlying operating system. We don't even think about the containers that the code is running in. We just write pure application code and it runs triggered by different events. It's also the leveraging of dedicated third parties for things like backend logic and states, using things like Firebase inside of Google or Cognito inside of AWS to manage user profiles, password reset, MFA, those sort of things. Trying to leverage as much SaaS and off the shelf as a service solutions as opposed to building everything custom. There is a framework with the same name, the serverless framework, which we'll talk about a bit later as we see some examples. It makes it a bit confusing to talk about serverless. Largely we'll be talking about serverless, the architectural movement, rather than the framework, but the framework is pretty useful. So it comes up quite a bit. And sorry, there's some background noise from the side. Um, why do people adopt a service way to build applications? Well, primarily there's a cost reduction. It's a pay per use model in which we pay for the code's runtime. So there's often a cost reduction in the overall AWS bill. Also, as we start to reduce the operational requirements, so we don't have to do security patching, we don't have to think about the operating system, there's actually reduced the total cost of ownership. Not only the cost to build, but also the cost to run, maintain, patch, and secure these applications. There's not no ops, there's still some ops. We still need to make sure we're building good quality applications, but we can dedicate our operations resource to more value bringing activities like FinOps or monitoring or observability. Developers can focus more on delivering business value. They're not focusing on writing infrastructure as code. Instead, sorry, they're not focusing on managing the infrastructure. Instead, they're primarily focusing on writing the core application code. And it's scalable from day one. And as we start to make more efficient usage of the compute resource in our data centers, 
it can also reduce the carbon footprint of the internet, which is growing rapidly and is starting to rival the aviation industry. When people think about serverless, Lambda is often the service people think of, sort of the poster child for serverless. It allows us to run application code in response to different events. It's called the function as a service. Basically, we write some very pure application code. It's triggered by an event and that code runs. There are a number of different runtimes that Lambda can run in. It can use Python, which we're gonna see a few examples in today. Node.js is also extremely popular, .NET, Go, Ruby, Java. And you can also, through a bootstrap file, run any language. I've actually run a custom PHP application before in a fully serverless way. And there's also container support now, so you can bring your own Docker image and still run in a serverless way. Looking at Python in particular, and there's a number of different supported versions, 2.7 has just dropped off the supported roadmap, but Python version three is primarily what people are using with serverless these days. A serverless Lambda function typically has a handler function, which is the piece of code that's gonna to react to the events. And a handler function is a really clean function of code that takes an event in a context the event is a set of information about the event that triggered it. If it was a REST API event that triggered the code to run, it would be the body of that request and any headers and cookies, et cetera. And the context is a bit more metadata about the event that was triggered. And not all events will be REST and HTTP. You can have events from other AWS services, as we'll see later, but that event object gives you the core information about the event that's come through. If we take that a bit further, we can build a message out of some parameters of that event, and then we can return that event message, which will go back to whichever service had triggered it, or whichever REST API or direct invocation had triggered it. So a handler function is a function of code that's triggered by AWS when your Lambda function is invoked. And you don't care about the operating system or the underlying mechanics of how that's working. And under the hood, it's all based on Firecracker, which is a micro VM technology that's now been open sourced, but you don't have to deal with any of that complexity, that's completely abstracted. Now you can provision all of this on the AWS console, click through to Lambda, click through to create new function, copy paste your code in. But typically we want to use infrastructure as code some template that can allow us to define how our applications can be built that allows us to monitor changes and deploy very consistently. The serverless framework is a really great framework in this space. It tries to be cloud agnostic, although it is primarily uh, built towards AWS. And under the hood, it's generating cloud formation, which is a native infrastructure as code on AWS, which is slightly different to Terraform, which is hitting the underlying APIs. But in our case, it's very simple for us to start using serverless. To use serverless, we use NPM. Uh, to install the serverless framework. So we are using some examples here in Python. You can also use examples in Node. Serverless, the framework happens to be an NPM dependency and NPM is the package manager typically used by Node. So NPM install dash G serverless, that's installing NPM globally on our computer. And then we can run serverless create, give it a template here saying AWS Python 3. We could also say Node.js and it would give us a different template. And then the path uh, for this service. So we're calling it my service. This will generate two files for us, a serverless.yaml, which is the infrastructure as code that's gonna define the structure of our application, and the handler.py, which is a handler function that we saw before. If we take that handler function from before a bit further to sort of fit it into a REST context, here we're defining a function called hello, which again has that event and context. We're defining a body, which is gonna be the body of what we're gonna send back. And then we're sending back a response given the status code and converting that body, which is a Python dict, into a JSON object, which will be interpreted by a browser that might be calling it. In the service.yaml part of this, which is the infrastructure's code, we're giving the service name as well as the provider here being AWS and the runtime being Python 3.7. And then we can list the functions that we can have. And typically different microservices can have a different number of functions and also other AWS resources. But here we're just giving one function, which is called hello and the handler function, which is the actual sort of lines of code that will be called when this function is invoked is handler.hello, so the handler file and the hello function inside that file. We can then invoke this with the service framework, so SLS, just so short for serverless. We run SLS invoke local dash F, meaning the function hello, and that's gonna invoke it locally, so it's gonna run the code on our actual computer. If we wanna ship this up to the cloud, where it's actually gonna run, we run SLS deploy. We will have had to have configured our laptop to authenticate with AWS before. If you want to see how to do that, the service framework, but also AWS have very extensive documentation. It's quite easy to start working with that. And then we can run SLS invoke dash F hello. Here, we're not saying local anymore. So we're invoking that actual function in the cloud and we're getting back that status and that message. And there are a number of different services that can trigger Lambda functions. If this was a talk about building sort of web applications and REST APIs, we would look at API gateway to trigger HTTP invocations. But in this talk, we're gonna talk about parallelism and how we can build more parallel workflows into our web applications. The other services that natively trigger, and there are lots of them that do, but a small sample here is Cognito for that 
identity as a service, getting triggered when a user authenticates or when a user registers, DynamoDB, which is a completely serverless database, API Gateway, Lex, Alexa, EventBridge, Kinesis. There's really a massive number of services that natively trigger Lambda. And the key point here is serverless is not just the function as a service part, the Lambda part. It's also S3 for storage. DynamoDB is a completely serverless NoSQL database. API Gateway to add routing into our application, Cognito for authentication, SQS for queuing, step functions for managed workflows, which we're going to see a bit later, can really be useful when we're doing parallel workflows. And EventBridge, which typically becomes the main sort of communication pathway for events between different microservices. And typically when we work with serverless, we build a number of different interconnected microservices, typically connected by an event-driven architecture, making use of the different services for what they want to do. And if you're interested in seeing a bit more about what a typical serverless architecture looks like, and I'll share the slides afterwards, you can go to medium.com slash serverless transformation. And we've got a big article where we jump into each different component of a web application and what services can do. But today we're gonna to drill into Lambda and step functions to see how we can handle parallel workflows when we're building web applications with serverless. Now Lambda, as we talked about before, has some interesting characteristics. Its memory now ranges from 128 to over 10,000 megabytes. The timeout is 9,000 seconds, which is 15 minutes. And that timeout, if we were to go through an HTTP connection, would of course be shorter, limited by API Gateway to about 30 seconds. But if we invoke it directly or through another service, we can get up to 15 minutes of compute time. Burst concurrency, I'll talk about a bit later, but that's how it can sort of scale. The temp directory, which is the only way we can write to disk on a Lambda function is limited to 512 megabytes, although that can be increased by using the Elastic File Service. And concurrent executions, which is the limit on how many concurrently executing Lambda functions we can have in our accounts, is limited to 1,000 by default, but this is a soft limit. This is a limit you can get AWS to raise quite considerably higher, to the, higher than this. And the only reason it's limited is to protect you in case you accidentally call your Lambda functions too many times and build up a big AWS thing. But what happens if our task takes longer than 15 minutes, that 900 second limit? And this is something that actually does happen when we have more complex workflows. An example I worked with a client on fairly recently is on PDF generation, which if you're a web developer these days, you probably have to deal with a couple of times and isn't always the most fun task on your backlog. Um, but we had an application where it builds reports uh, for a particular industry. The reports are built with React and a JS graphing library, and users had the ability to export their reports for a number of different compliance purposes. But these reports were extremely long due to that compliance use case. Like we're talking hundreds up to thousands of pages long, which meant that that took a very long time to run. In this web application, we had the sort of existing system serving the application. The existing system wasn't serverless. And then we had a Lambda function calling that existing system using Chromium, a headless Chrome, to generate the PDF and then writing that PDF to S3. Um, and just to, before we carry on, and the point here is that that PDF generation process could take longer than 900 seconds for some of these longer PDFs. A quick side note on Lambda scaling though, as we talked about before, there's a concurrency limit. When Lambda function is invoked, it creates an instance of that function that runs as a handler, runs the handler function that we saw before, and then returns the response. That function remains active for a while. And when it initially starts, there's something called the cold start time, which we'll talk about a bit later, but that's a delay in the time before that function becomes available to run. If we invoke it again afterwards, which is called a warm start as opposed to a cold start, that time is faster. So the Lambda function stays up for a while so it can handle other requests that come in. If that Lambda function is invoked again while it's still running, so, and the motion sensor lights in this office have turned off. Uh, if the Lambda function um, is invoked again while it's running, it will spin up another basically instance of that function, which will then process the next request. And then we're getting concurrent execution of our computes. That concurrency though is limited uh, by the concurrency limit that we saw before. So concurrency is a number of those Lambda instances that can serve a request at a given time. When we do have a particular burst of traffic, there's a burst concurrency quota, which is a limit to how fast we can scale up. And after that, we're then limited to 500 new instances per minute. And there's an overall concurrency limit, which is that soft limit that we can raise, um, as well as some stuff we can do provision to reserve concurrency. But typically we see a really big sort of up ramp in concurrency. We then hit that uh, burst concurrency limit. We increase at 500 per minute, and then we hit whichever concurrency limit we've set on our accounts but we can raise that big concurrency limit and start to do some interesting things. Going back to the PDF example, if we look at our cold start, warm start, that's sort of some fixed cost. But when we get into the next part, this is where we have our very long running process. When that PDF 
grows, the boxes in red are going to grow proportional to the length of that PDF. And if that grows beyond the 900 second mark, and for a user experience, 15 minutes before clicking between clicking something and getting a response is a bit too long. Uh, we start to have problems, especially as behind uh, past 900 uh, seconds, we're also just not going to be able to run that on Lambda anymore. But what we can do is break the PDF up into a number of chunks, run independent Lambda functions to generate the PDF, write the results to S3, and then have another Lambda function which collates that all together and writes it to another S3 buckets. But to orchestrate all of that, we don't want to do that manually with a series of Lambda functions calling each other. It's dangerous because that sort of um, recursive parallelism can get quite expensive. And also it's very hard to debug if things go wrong. Step functions is a really great serverless service from AWS. Uh, that's basically a function orchestrator, meaning that it makes it easy for us to sequence a number of Lambda functions as well as other AWS services into sort of application workflows. And at its core, it's a finite state machine. So anyone who's sort of looked into the computer science side of things, finite state machines are quite familiar to them. It's a start state and an end state. And in between, there's a number of other states which we can go between. And some of them can happen at the same time. In CloudFormation, which is that native infrastructure as a code on AWS, it's quite verbose. I can't actually scroll, but this goes on a lot further down. It's quite verbose to define these state machines. Luckily for the service framework, there's a plugin called serverless step functions. And we can bring this down to quite a concise set of infrastructure as code where we define step functions. We have our state machine. We're saying the name of this is my machine. The definition, we can give a comment about what it's doing. And then the states which exist there. And the state here we have is hello world, which is a task, meaning it's going to call a Lambda function. We give the ARN, which is the resource number basically of that Lambda function. And this is the only state in this state machine. But there's a number of different things. We can do things that are not just tasks. We can orchestrate a series of Lambda functions. We can have branching logic, basically an if condition inside of our state machine. We can have some human approval. We can have error handling. We can have parallel processing, meaning the same input is given to a number of Lambda functions. Or we can have dynamic parallelism, which we're gonna look at in just a minute, where we have basically an array and we can spin out a number of Lambda functions needed to process the elements of that array. And that dynamic parallelism is called the map state. So it runs a set of steps on each uh, element of an input array. It needs an iterator, which is an object which defines the state machine to run on each element of that array, an item path, which is a location of that array in the inputs, and a maximum concurrency, which is the maximum limit we're giving on how many Lambda functions can, it can spin out. So we can limit that, and there's also a limit inside of step functions on how that big that can be. If we go back to the PDF generation example, we have the start states, we have the generate chunks function, which looks at how long the PDF is, and then splits that into a number of chunks of, in this case, 30 pages. We then have that as the input, that's the, the input path points to that array of the iterator. And the iterator is a very simple state machine, which is one step, which is a task, which is a Lambda function that does the cloning. And then we have a collation stage, which takes the output of the iterator, which is the S3 location, of the generated PDF. We use a library in JavaScript like Hummus, which basically is a PDF manipulation library, which can merge those all back together. And then we write the results to an S3 bucket and output the location of that generated PDF. That's one example of in a web application generating reports, how parallelism can be quite useful. Another interesting place it can be quite useful is in load testing with serverless applications. I mentioned before that serverless applications are by their nature extremely scalable, which is great, but verifying that scalability and spotting any problems when it scales can become difficult because you're getting to quite high scalability. This week at Theodo, we were building for a client a chat application that can support 250,000 people chatting concurrently. It's quite difficult to validate that that works without having quite a high, highly scalable testing infrastructure. Uh, another example of an application uh, I worked on in the past is a company called Gamercraft. They build sort of tournaments on top of League of Legends and have sort of matchmaking algorithms between different players. Again, because they're a tournament application, it's a very spiky traffic path, which means we had to validate some of the scalability. Their architecture was completely serverless using Lambda, Step Functions, DynamoDB, S3, Cognito, API Gateway, and then EventBridge to tie all those microservices together. To dig into one of those microservices, it's then a lot of Lambda functions, uh, Step Functions, DynamoDB, and other services. And because there's different concurrency limits on all of those different services, Without actually running the application at scale, it's hard to validate we've not forgotten to configure something in the right way. So to generate enough traffic for us to be able to validate load testing. Now, Artillery is an open source load testing tool that's used by a lot of site reliability engineers to test applications. 
And to, to run an artillery definition, we basically give it a target, a number of phases of ramp up, that's ramp up of the load that we're giving, uh, payload, which is could be a CSV of keywords, and we can use a library like Faker to generate some fake data, a number of scenarios, just so to search and buy for an item, these are the steps to go through. And then locally, we can run artillery, uh, sorry, Zoom's getting in the way, but basically we run artillery and point it towards that file. But when we want to scale this to a massive degree, it scales past the capabilities of our laptop. And we could go and run this on a server, but probably from the previous slides of my introduction, you can tell servers aren't my favorite way of doing things. So we need a different way to run it. And we really need a service that enables us to run code without thinking about the underlying uh, infrastructure with a massive degree of parallelism. And that's where Lambda can be really useful in actually validating the scalability of our serverless architectures. And there's a really great open source project called Serverless Artillery or SLS Art, which combines serverless with artillery to give us a completely serverless way to do load testing. Basically, we define that artillery definition that we saw before. We run SLS Art, which is serverless artillery to deploy into AWS and then invoke. This actually under the hood orchestrates a number of Lambda functions that can then go and basically attack our target architecture. Hopefully it's an architecture that we own. We should be validating the scalability of our own architectures, not pointing at other people's. Um, and an important point to mention is we should run this from a different AWS account from our actual architecture because those concurrency limits are gonna be taken up by both the load testing and the application. So we need to run this in a completely, from a completely isolated environment to get more realistic scalability metrics. A few more real world examples that I didn't work on personally, but I think are really interesting. The UAE has a Mars mission, which is currently sending data back from Mars. The data that they're sending back, they need to process, and it's quite large volumes of data. So they're actually using AWS to do that data. And they're using step functions to break down and index all the data that's coming back, and then write that to S3 for later processing by batch, which is another AWS service. But they're using Lambda and the dynamic parallelism of step functions to process data coming back from the UAE Mars mission, which I think is really exciting. And I'll share the slides later, and there's a link to the, the article written about it on the AWS blog. NeuroBridge is a really interesting project as well, also in, the, in academia, where they're combining uh, electron microscope and like micro, light microscope imagery of fruit flies to, to sort of study the different neuron pathways and validate what they're doing. They have a huge amount of data they need to process, and typically that would be done by very expensive on-premise machines that they used to have at universities. But using AWS, they're actually using step functions to automatically trigger a lot of Lambda functions and then check the results that are being written into DynamoDB. And that's scaling all the way up to 3,000 concurrent Lambda functions doing that processing before it ends and then writes the results to DynamoDB. And again, I'll link to the slides later, but you can read the full case study on that and the work that they're doing. And all of the code for that's open source. So you can read through. It's quite interesting code that they're up to. In conclusion, serverless is an architectural movement uh, that allows us to abstract a lot of the complexities of building and running applications. It's not just Lambda, which seems to be the poster child for serverless, but there are many other serverless services. Serverless services like Lambda have very elastic scaling with the ability to have extremely high concurrency. And um, we need to remember that large problems can be broken down into chunks and orchestrated by serverless uh, services like step functions. If you want to find the slides, you can go to slides.com slash Ben Ellaby. I'll share that afterwards. And we've written up some of this on the service transformation medium. So feel free to read through that. And if you have any questions, feel free to ask them in the chat now, or you can ask me on Twitter directly if you want to. Um, yeah, thanks so much. Awesome, thank you, Ben. Um, there's some really nice comments in the uh, chat there. I don't know whether you saw them. Um, Parol said, even as someone who's still new to learning code, it's explained in a, a really good way. Um, so yeah, some some really nice. We have got a question just came in. Um, do the slides, blog posts, etc., make cost comparisons with bare metal? Um, these slides don't, um, but we've written about a sort of serverless cost calculator, uh, which is basically a Google sheet that you can play around with. It's all on the serverless transformation blog. I'll share the link to that. Well, if you search serverless uh, transformation, you'll find all the stuff. There's a calculator on there, which you can use to estimate the cost of a particular architecture. Comparing with directly between bare metal can be a bit misleading because there's a total cost of ownership argument, but typically we're finding even the AWS bill itself is reduced. Um, when we say bare metal, that's comparing to something like EC2 rather than something on-premise, but on-premise you need a data center and a building and rent and that all gets extremely expensive. 
Fair enough. And with the um, the PDF example that you kind of you know kicked off with, sure. do you have a like a before and after? You know how long it might take, you know, before you change the approach. So we originally built it with in a serverless way because the rest of the architecture was serverless, but we didn't have these huge compliance PDFs. We had quite small PDFs. When the compliance PDF started, it was taking longer than 900 seconds. So it was just crashing. Uh, so it was from crashing to not crashing. Um, but I think if we sort of, um, what's the right word? If we took the, the request that was happening and extrapolated it based on how long the PDFs were taking, we were talking greater than half an hour to generate the PDF. And we took that down to less than five minutes, oh, nice. which for a user is a big change. Yeah, definitely. Cool, thank you. Um, any other questions? This is the awkward bit where nobody says anything and then we just wait. Yeah. Okay. But the, the time savings can be even more dramatic if, if things really support the parallelism well. Uh, I've had um, tasks that were, say, 15 minutes before um, and they were then able to be done across thousands of invocations simultaneously or near simultaneously and you get the runtime down to say four seconds. So it, it, it can be um, an amazing improvement in performance. That's great. The, and I've seen that on sort of the sort of basic REST calls and that side of things. When it was a PDF generation, because there's that sunk cost of spinning up a browser, we could never yeah. get past a certain limit finishing returns yeah. after a certain point of scaling out. But yeah, tasks can go down to sub millisecond sometimes uh, sub second yeah. sometimes which is really yeah exciting. yeah it can make things that you used to have to do by like having users like returned a um, mm -hmm. a token that's then checked minutes later to actually just returning it in near real time yeah exactly Awesome. Well, unless we've got any other questions, I think we can probably wrap things up. <laughs> thank you. Really yeah. enjoyed the talk, Ben. Oh, and thanks followed, so much, you too. I followed you on Twitter as well. So drop us a follow back. Of Please. course, thanks. <laughs> That's all I go ask. <laughs> thank you. Are we are we wrapping up, Laura? Yeah, I think so. If anyone wants to, you know, stay on and mingle, I'll leave <laughs> open, but I'll stop recording. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to go pick myself up some. some